Good evening and welcome to this evening's meeting of the Board of Education. Welcome to the second 2022-2023 budget workshop meeting of the Board of Education. I would like to start by explaining the format of tonight's meeting. The Board of Education provides two opportunities for you to express your ideas and share your thoughts. Each session will be 30 minutes in duration and all speakers will be limited to three minutes to give as many people a chance to speak as possible. As a reminder, during special meetings, public participation is limited to the topic on the agenda. Please approach the microphone in the front of the auditorium. Please state your name prior to beginning your comments so the district clerk can accurately reflect the minutes of tonight's meeting. Mrs. Rogers will, you, will let you know when you have 30 seconds left so you can wrap up your comments before the end of the three minutes. You must be stationed at a microphone to express your ideas and share your thoughts with the board. The Board of Education respects the varied opinions of the community and will provide a comfortable and safe environment. Any behaviors that threaten the integrity of tonight's meeting will not be tolerated and will cause the Board of Education to adjourn the meeting. Complaints or challenges should follow procedures listed under policies 1400, 1410, and or 1440, which are included on the materials table. Thank you for your anticipated courtesy and cooperation. In the event of fire and or if you hear the fire bell, you must leave the building. The first 10 rows in the auditorium should use the exit to my left. Those in the back of the room should use the rear doors and exit the building to the left. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> I'd like to open the meeting for the first public participation. Please be sure to clearly state your name when you approach the microphone. As a reminder, public participation will be limited to 30 minutes. Each individual speaker will have three minutes in which to ask their questions or to make any statements. The district clerk will hold the timer for us. If we do not get to all of the speakers during the first 30 minutes, we will reopen later in the meeting to continue. The meeting is now open. Okay, th thank you everyone. Mr. Defendini, tonight will be our second uh, budget workshop. Thank you, Mr. Goldberg. Um, yeah, so we're continuing our conversations with the community and the Board of Education tonight surrounding our 2022-23 school budget. Uh, I'm gonna turn over to Mike Motisi in just a moment uh, so that he can get a little bit deeper into some of the um, finer details uh, pertaining to the budget when we start to look at uh, what actually is changing as a result of the uh, appropriation and revenue type items that he was speaking about in the first public uh, meeting last Wednesday. Uh, but before we do that, I just again wanted to remind, um, you know, the board as well as any community members that might be listening that we do appreciate this process and we do see this as a process, uh, an interactive process. You're going to see changes to tonight's presentation. You're going to see changes to uh, the tax levy as an example based upon conversations uh, that took place with the Board of Education leading up to last week and even over the course of the last week. Um, again, we, we appreciate the communication and the, the uh, questions that we've received from the community. We have received some pretty thoughtful questions from the community over the course of the last week. Uh, and we will respond uh, again in kind every time we do get a question from the community. Um, also, uh, again, once the board, uh, the, the board of Education approves the budget, um, in order to be 100% transparent, uh, we do provide a comprehensive line-by-line -line reading the budget, uh, you know, type um, document for the community that they can look at up on our website uh, so that they can get as deep into things as they want to, or, or if they're just, you know, good on the surface because they want to feel for what we're trying to do, then we'll do that for them too. So uh, the goal at the end of the day is obviously to make sure that the community has a really solid understanding of exactly what we're trying to do, what we're asking from the community, what we're providing to the community as a result of an approved budget, so that uh, on that day when they do vote, they have all the information they need to make an informed decision. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Motisi to pick up. Uh, with a little bit of a review, uh, and then a bunch of slides, uh, you know, talking a little bit more depth, deeply about uh, programmatic and other type changes that we are projecting for next year. Thank you, Mr. Deppandini. So tonight's presentation uh, is a quick review of last week's presentation, as well as some updates uh, that I have for the board regarding the numbers, as Mr. Deppandini mentioned. Uh, from there, we're going to move into uh, some of the instructional 
initiatives, specifically the instructional staffing initiatives that are really driving the numbers behind the, uh, the next year's budget. Um, and then on to our current capital uh, and facilities work that is underway and some projects that we are looking into as well as some long-term planning uh, initiatives uh, that are um, in the works. So as a quick review and a reminder to anyone new that might be watching, um, this year's presentation, or this year's budget I mean, was heavily focused um, around this quote that is there on the screen. And it's, and it's a quote by Benjamin Franklin and it says, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. And if there's one driving goal behind this year's budget that, that, that trumped the rest, it's addressing the increasing need for student support services. And as we go through tonight's presentation, we're gonna go a little bit more into that work with Dr. Olson and Ms. Maloney uh, regarding the staffing initiatives that are underway um, and the reasons behind all of that work. This is a revised uh, proposed revenue budget for next year. As you recall, last week we had um, our tax levy increase at 2.06 that is also the tax levy increase that was reported in Newsday for the school district. Last week we mentioned that we would continue to work with the Board of Education and with administration to uh, lower that levy um, to be uh, more in line with the Nassau County average uh, without sacrificing any of the initiatives that we know that we need here in Farmingdale. I'm happy to report that um, due to actually two, two factors, um, one being we uh, an additional pilot property was actually discovered which helped lower the levy. Um, that was uh, something that came to us literally in the mail last week. So at the last minute, we were able to use that to help adjust the levy. And in addition, uh, we were able to lower the levy uh, by looking at some of the projects and, and making some tweaks along the way uh, as to what was planned for next year. So if you recall from last week, we reported um, that the Nassau County average um, was approximately 1.75. That was based on the data that I had at the time. I did see a Newsday article that uh, came out recently that said the average tax increase was looking to go up about 1.9. Um, we've managed to get our proposed levy for next year down to 1.59 for this community. The uh, revisions here to the cost element summary, uh, very small revisions, but it did balance out the budget. Um, we were able to reduce some of the projects that I, I mentioned were planned for next year, changing the scope a little bit, but still keeping the intent uh, behind everything that was planned with next year's budget. Um, and then right at the top, I wanna highlight for a minute the, the increase in salaries, which is the driving force behind our budget. That number is a combination of multiple factors, including um, additional staffing that we had been hired uh, both this year and for next year, and as well as um, a multi, multi-year uh, contractual bargaining agreements that were now settled. So you're actually seeing um, two years of increases in there, as well as STEP that is causing that increase. That will level off next year with the 23-24 uh, budget as as all contracts uh, will have uh, be entering the third year uh, of their uh, of their um, term. A little below that, with the employee benefits increase, we did see for the first time in a while uh, an increase in the health benefits. We're going to go through that a little bit later on in the presentation, um, and then really all the other appropriation items are really being driven by two things: increased student needs and inflation. Their inflation is hurting everybody and school districts are not immune to that. We still have to pay the same costs that are associated uh, with transporting goods, uh, with supply chain constraints. So the increases in, in all of those other, other appropriation items uh, are being driven by those needs. The contingent budget slide changed as well a little bit. As a reminder, the contingent budget, uh, the reduction that you see on the screen of uh, approximately $2 million is a result of a zero increase in the levy year over year. So should the district have to go to a contingent budget, that would be um, the reduction that would be required to the budget. And again, that process is something that we would have to work with the Board of Education on 
um, in order to arrive at what reductions would be made because it's not just a straight two million dollar reduction to the budget there's a there's a state formula that needs to be followed in order to do that but some of the things that we would have to look at um, would be increased class sizes reduced elective opportunities athletics musical performing groups uh, extracurricular activities certain equipment purchases or maintenance or facility projects and and support services now we're going to move along to the uh, instructional staffing initiatives and I'm going to turn it over to Miss Maloney thank you we are providing training for our staff to better support student growth and address the increase in the number of students experiencing learning behavior and emotional problems the first step is to help students learn to manage their emotions. And as you see there, for example, self-awareness, consider and understand your own emotions, self-management, regulate emotions and impulse control, responsible decision-making, social awareness, which is understanding others' perspectives, relationship skills in particular, resolving conflicts constructively, listening well, and understanding appropriate and inappropriate social behaviors. By doing this, our work is focused on eliminating barriers to success because, as I just mentioned, the need has grown. We're working to help students as they deal with the stressors in their lives so they are able to learn and thrive. Our approach is an all hands on deck one that includes both academic and emotional support. Our school counseling, social work, and psychologist supports have increased. For example, we will have an addition of an elementary school counselor who will be providing lessons for all students in essential school readiness skills. Unique for next year, we're having a change. The middle school counselor, social worker, and psychologist teams have been reconfigured. They'll be providing academic monitoring and scaffold supports to meet students' needs, for example, organizational groups, study skills workshops, friendship groups, etc. Also, supports for our students with disabilities have increased, for example, multisensory reading, a 611 kindergarten class, and increased supports such as speech and language services. This work, along with the work of Dr. Olson's team, is designed to help students reach their full potential. Thank you. This budget will continue to support our elementary programs, as well as our robust course catalogs at the middle school and the high school. In addition, we will have four new course offerings. The first one is Python Pro Programming 2. This course is for students who really want to seek out computer programming as a vocation. Python is a foundational coding language used for Facebook, Google, YouTube, Spotify, and many video games. Students, this, this course will support students who have a desire to explore computer science and programming in their future. Next, AP Environmental Science and Regents Earth Science is a combined curriculum. It will give students the opportunity to gain AP credit in ninth grade. It combines the curriculums of AP Environmental Science with Regents level Earth Science. It is a, rigor a rigorous course that will provide the students two double periods every day of science. Next is a civic readiness course. This high school elective will give students the opportunity to apply and demonstrate their civic knowledge by designing service projects to support our community. Students will, learn, will earn points to towards the seal of civic readiness upon graduation. Finally, our fourth new course offering is Heritage Spanish. This course is for the native Spanish speaker. It will focus on developing literacy skills for students who are fluent in Spanish. It will develop reading and writing skills like a typical English course. It will be able to be taken in both Howitt and at the middle school. Additionally, we will be expanding our ENL courses to align with 
the way we have formatted it over the years in the high school. We will provide more support in both science and math classes. Additionally, we will create smaller class sizes in our math classes at the high school, specifically algebra and geometry. Thank you. Thank you. From here, we're going to move into some of the capital uh, discussions for tonight. Uh, we're going to start off with the current status of um, the, our currently in progress or approved work, um, starting with the energy performance contract, number two, which is um, currently still being worked on and sent up to the state. Um, we had to make some changes that we discussed with the board throughout the year um, as a result of some of the locations and some of the measurements that had changed. Um, but as far as all of the savings and the cost and all of that are concerned, nothing has changed there. Um, I actually did reach out to H2M a couple of weeks ago regarding these numbers to make sure that these are still valid and they did check with Johnson Controls and Johnson Controls still stands by the numbers that are there on the screen. So again, uh, we're going to go into some of the details regarding this project real quickly. Um, but the total cost of the project, 11.1 million. There's four energy conservation measures. The savings have to be guaranteed. That is a part of an energy performance contract. The engineers have to guarantee that they will achieve the savings objectives. Um, otherwise, they're required to fix such uh, initiatives in order to make sure that they are achieved. Um, and over, over time with the, uh, the state aid um, and, the, and the savings, it creates a positive cash flow situation for the district of $4.8 million. So the four energy conservation measures include um, LED lighting, both interior and exterior. They'll be replacing over 11,000 interior fixtures and uh, 263 exterior fixtures. There is also going to be a window film portion of this project um, that uh, they will be covering almost uh, a little over 69,000 square feet of window with that throughout, throughout the district. Um, those window panes are um, allow the heat to uh, stay in the buildings and it actually reflects the heat in the summertime so that you're using less uh, air conditioning uh, during, during the summer months or or letting less heat into the buildings uh, and classrooms when the sun is at its strongest. Um, and then lastly, and the biggest portion of this project are the, uh, the renewable energy or the solar carports. And that's really where the big change was that has caused the delay in the project. Um, but we're gonna go through some pictures right now so that everyone can see what these solar arrays look like and where they're going to be. So this is actually the Farmingdale High School. You're looking at, um, this is the back lot at the high school and then this is the student lot. Originally, the solar arrays were planned to be over the faculty section of the parking lot, which is just south of the big bus lot. Uh, but they ran into some uh, structural problems with the way the, the, uh, the, the sewers were run and the way the parking lot was laid out. And they decided to move it over to the, uh, the student lot. Um, which is actually getting us a little bit more in terms of solar panels and coverage. Um, and it's going to afford us the opportunity to um, actually redo the lot. So that's part of uh, the capital planning that's happening with this project and a little bit of what we're going to talk about uh, further in, along in the presentation. This is currently the, the only space over at the Howitt Middle School is going to be the back lot that is actually the staging site for the uh, construction of the aquatic center right now. Um, that was really the only spot that they were able to uh, make it aesthetically pleasing to the community and uh, also not uh, do any damages to the, uh, to the work that had been done in the athletic complex. There are some discussions about possibly doing a future um, uh, EPC number three or a future solar project in which case there would be solar panels put on the roof and what you see all of the roof work here at how it would then be covered with solar panels which would generate a tremendous amount of uh, kilowatts but that's for a later conversation over at albany avenue this is the uh, the south lot over at albany avenue along the southern state you can see there's three arrays planned for down there 
um, north side. The, again, this is the faculty lot, so that's the the um, the uh, north side of the lot, and then the east side of the lot, um, or west side of the lot, I should say. Um, and those are three arrays that are planned for over there. And then here's Sals Salsman. Uh, the entire uh, faculty lot is being planned for uh, solar arrays. And lastly, Woodward Parkway, the f again, in the faculty lot in the back. So we tried very hard to make sure that um, when they proposed this project that they weren't putting these arrays um, directly in people's front windows. We wanted to make sure that they, were try they tried their best to keep them in the back lots of the schools um, in, in big areas. Here's an example of what they will look like once complete. Um, this is a, a carport that was recently completed over in the Smithtown School District. Um, most, of our, um, most of our structures will resemble this structure, with the exception of the one structure that's gonna be going into the student lot because of the size of our student, uh, I'm sorry, of the high school bus lot because of the size of that lot, they're actually designing uh, what they're calling a superstructure, which is actually gonna have two pillars or two columns of steel that are gonna be required to hold them up because that's how much bigger they're actually going to be. And this is just uh, an example to show you uh, the, the way they look right now for uh, if you were to use the regular ones um, with a school bus. Moving along to the aquatic center, um, thought it'd be nice to show everyone a picture of what the aquatic center looked like exactly one year ago when I did this presentation. This was actually the picture that we used. And I went up on the roof the other day and took this picture. So it is, uh, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. And what you're not really seeing is, you know, all, when all the steel came in and, and, and the siding was put on the roofs and all the HVAC work was put in on top, and then all of the work that went on inside is a lot, a lot, a lot that has accomplished, that has been accomplished in a year. Um, they are outside currently doing all of the curb work. They're doing concrete work. Um, there is a fence, an actual fence that is not a construction fence, but a real fence around the facility now. And it's really starting to open up and come to life. Um, when we get into the inside pictures, I, I tried to get a few good shots um, for the community and for the board. It does look like a little bit of a construction site, but I'm going to try and do my best to, uh, to uh, paint a picture for you. So this is actually the north side of the building. Um, and as you can see, this is uh, well underway. There is a, a section of glass that is missing right now, um, right there in the middle where that blue tarp is. Um, that is because we still need to get a lot of big machinery and construction equipment into the building. Um, but all the glass is up, um, and you're actually looking at that big section is obviously the competition swimming pool, and the smaller uh, entrance over there is the entranceway into the lobby. Just another angle for you. Um, as you can see, the competition pool is in the background, um, and this is the, the lobby going over uh, to the... Uh, to the Ch Cherry Street, and then further along, we're going to come around in a couple of minutes and show you another picture from, from Cherry Street. This is actually a picture from the athletic complex where uh, taken on Friday of last week. That's our, our district architect and our district superintendent that decided to put themselves in the picture. Um, th they're actually laying the concrete, so as you can see, there's no more fence over there now. There are bollards up. There's lighting going up soon. Um, it's really moving along fast. This is actually from uh, the lot that I just actually talked about before where the uh, solar arrays will go, the solar carports would go. So this is a, almost a, a, alongside the West Building. And um, you're looking at the community pool section right now. So over here is the com community pool. And then this is the en main entrance uh, to the lobby right by that van uh, where there's actually not even a door yet. There's just a, a bunch of plywood that we're using as doors. Another shot closer to Cherry Street, same side. This is the community pool. Um, the windows are not in yet, but as you can see, um, coming along nicely. And then you have all of the um, 
where all the lighting is going to go and the curb work already in place. Once you enter the building um, in the main corridor area, this is all of the, um, the painters are now underway. They're doing all of the painting work. So what you're looking at here is all of the HVAC and the duct work throughout the facility, which had just recently been painted. Moving along to the uh, competition side, this is the entryway um, to the locker room on the uh, competition side of the aquatic center. Uh, the first picture on the left is a little dark, um, but I wanted to really let you see the color, which you can see in the right picture, of what the flooring looks like and the walls will look like. So it's a, uh, it's a gray uh, marble epoxy uh, on the floor. Um, and that, that's the one of the locker rooms. The locker, lockers obviously aren't in there yet. Um, and then this main en this entryway, this hallway on the left side is the entryway to the offices, the bathrooms, and the locker rooms. And then right out those double doors is actually the um, athletic complex. So that's where an emergency exit. Here's a shot across from the uh, competition pool. So you're looking at the stands. Uh, where actually where the scoreboard would be and right now the painters are in there and they're painting all of the steel on the top of the complex as well as the walls and just a shot from the stands this is uh, the uh, a shot of the community pool which is also uh, under construction <laughs> Um, it was the best shot that I could try to get. I got up on a lift. Uh, we had to stretch it out a little bit, uh, but you get the idea. It's, it's, um, it's, it's moving along with about the same rate as everything else. Um, things are moving a lot faster. I know it looks like there's a lot of work left, but they are really moving along a lot faster now that they're inside and the building is closed up. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Brennan for a minute to just give a, a brief update on the Smart Schools Bond Project. Thank you, Mr. Motisi. So a number of years ago, uh, we provided a very similar presentation uh, that the New York State uh, enacted a pretty considerable budget across the state for the enhancement of technology and other items uh, to the tune of $2 billion across the state. Um, here in Farmingdale, um, we've used uh, funding, which is approximately $2.9 million, uh, to complete a number of uh, projects and technological uh, upgrades can you just advance to the next one, please? Just to highlight the initial allowable project categories associated with smart, uh, bond, the Smart Bond Act include uh, the enhancement of internet broadband access, including uh, networking technology, wireless capability, uh, the improvement of classroom learning technology, that's uh, smart boards and computers, Chromebooks, uh, also the ability to enhance uh, facilities related to pre-kindergarten, and finally, the fourth one is to enhance uh, high-tech security features uh, throughout our district. So the state had made available uh, the $2.9 million, and uh, Farmingdale presented its investment plan a number of years ago, and that plan is still up on the website uh, on these three categories. The first is to address uh, the enhancement of high-tech security features across our school buildings. I'll go into some greater detail uh, momentarily on this. Also, to continue to uh, upgrade our uh, infrastructure from a wireless network perspective and all the networking equipment that's included that makes this uh, school district run uh, and provide advanced technology to our students and staff. And then finally, the third category where we have invested um, uh, funding has been in the upgrade of classroom technology. Again, I'm going to go into more detail on those in just a moment. Uh, this slide here highlights the approved budget, the uh, 2021 encumbered and expensed uh, items, as well as those items encumbered or expensed this year, and then the total expenditure. Uh, as I noted uh, just a moment ago, the farming day allocation was $2.9 million. Uh, at this point, uh, we have $390,000 still available uh, to us. And uh, in addition to that, um, add the next 335. So it's actually over uh, $700,000 that we still have available because the initial spending plan, we didn't yet allocate that $335,000. Uh, 
Um, some districts, truthfully, went ahead in one year and expensed this entire thing. Uh, Farmingdale, we've been in a very good position technologically. Uh, we've tried to build this into our refresh cycle uh, as it relates to high cost projects like networking technology, wireless video surveillance. So we're spreading that money out uh, over time. Next slide. When it comes to the classroom learning technology, probably the most significant uh, investment we've made is the uh, refresh of our old smart boards, Promethean boards. Uh, we've since replaced over 200 of those uh, with uh, newer technology. Uh, it's referred to as a new line board uh, with uh, uh, 4K uh, resolution. It's uh, really good uh, for kids to be able to see those clean boards and teachers to use them to teach. So uh, plan for next year as well are additional upgrades to some of that outdated uh, technology. Um, and the third item that we've highlighted there, which you probably saw on the uh, budget slide, was the TV media studio. Um, we have a thriving TV uh, media production program at our high school. Um, but one of the things a couple years ago that was brought forward to us is that that technology changes so quickly. And so working with the teaching staff there, uh, we really put together a plan to upgrade the equipment, the software, everything that makes a TV studio so that our children could leave Farming to High School with almost a collegiate or a professional sort of experience. This way they can hit the ground running and we're very pleased with the way that program has evolved. That was uh, completed last year, actually this year, this summer it was completed. Uh, so that's the classroom learning technology. Security is a uh, huge uh, investment uh, that we make every single year. We're constantly looking at um, the replacement of older cameras with newer cameras um, that have much better resolution and um, application. So we've increased, uh, I'm sorry, we've added in an increase uh, 210 uh, interior cameras, 68 exterior cameras. Uh, we've installed uh, cameras at the aquatic complex, the athletic complex, and with all these cameras comes the need for additional storage. Um, you know, where this stuff records to, we've upgraded the equipment and software in those locations. Um, a lot of this work uh, comes out of the safety committee, working with my colleague, uh, Mr. Zakian, and the work that he and his team do to identify key areas where cameras need to be replaced, added, uh, and upgraded. So uh, we're excited to continue to support that. It's really important. The other thing that we uh, completed this past year, uh, last year, was the one-button lockdown solution, uh, which allows us to uh, activate doors and um, uh, send out alerts and uh, just uh, put into a lockdown sort of way by pressing a single uh, button. Again, I highlighted the uh, upgrade of hardware and software um, to allow us to see quality images at, at sometimes great distances. So um, it's been really helpful. Uh, the one of the other components here is the high-speed internet and connectivity. As I mentioned, uh, Farmingdale for a number of years has invested a lot of uh, money and energy into providing a state-of-the-art infrastructure. It allows us to you know, conduct business in the classroom. Our wireless is very solid, but that requires the upkeep of our networking you know, switches, these things you may not see uh, all the time. They live in closets, and you know, this is what makes the whole place tick. Um, but you can see there's a number of upgrades across all the buildings, uh, those Cisco switches. And um, the other thing that we do on a uh, five-year basis is we look at our wireless access points. We refer to them as WAPs. Uh, we're now in the process of actually uh, configuring them. They've been hung, the majority of them have been, -hung, been hung in the uh, classrooms throughout the uh, district. I uh, still have a little bit of ways to go, but we have all items in our possession, and we expect to have that finished uh, by the end of this year. And uh, finally, the last piece, going back to the internet and connectivity, is storage. I highlighted, highlighted this a little bit with the um, su uh, surveillance, video surveillance. With all this data and all this information that we're collecting, it's got to go somewhere. You know, we always hear about the cloud, but, you know, a lot of things belong uh, here on the network, and we've uh, since upgraded our storage capacity and our backup capacity here at Howitt. I say Howitt because Howitt is where our uh, network operation center lives. That's the uh, uh, the backbone of the entire network. So that was a significant upgrade, and we need to you know stay on top of that every couple of years. Thank you, Dr. Brandon. 
We're going to move now into um, transfer to capital, commonly referred to as the 9950 transfer. Um, our plans are, and proposals for the capital reserve and future capital planning discussions. So currently uh, in the 21-22 school year, this is a, um, a list of projects that we were able to complete this year. Um, this was through a combination of general fund appropriations and um, uh, what is commonly referred to as the 9950 transfer or the transfer to capital. So we were able to achieve everything here, uh, upgraded fire alarms, um, the uh, the uh, the new career and uh, technical education area, the renovations over there at the high school, uh, ceiling tile replacements in both uh, for both the second and third floor of the Howitt West building. Um, uh, there were some handicap lifts that were installed over at in the athletic complex, uh, the Albany Avenue playground replacement, as well as some playground work over at Northside. And then, uh, if, I don't know if anyone has had a chance to be over to Salzman yet, but the locker replacement project was really the big project this year, um, and it completely changed the feel of that building. Um, they look amazing. If you next time you're over there, make sure you take note of it. The um, there are some future facility initiatives being considered, and um, on the prior slide, a lot of those projects are. Uh, funded through general fund appropriations or what like I had mentioned the uh, 90 transfer to capital the 9950 um, this year we are um, have, have a number of projects that we are working with the architects and the engineers on um, there's a, a various district-wide interior and exterior construction and renovation projects um, that we are looking into um, our intentions are to fund these projects through a combination of what is known as a 9950 transfer and through a drawdown on the capital reserve. So uh, I'd like to just briefly walk through some of these, um, but it, it is the district's intention uh, with the Board of Education to propose a drawdown on the reserves, and we're gonna go into that in a minute. Ultimately, that drawdown will have to be approved by the voters um, as a separate proposition when they go to vote on the budget. Uh, some of the projects that we are uh, planning for next year, um, there are uh, some, some playground work that we still need to finish out, uh, boiler and HVAC work, um, flooring abatements uh, district-wide. It's something that we like to chip away at. It, it has to be done over the summer, um, but it's something that we do need to, to, to concentrate on uh, throughout the district for the buildings that still have uh, anything, anything that could be, that needs to be abated. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the parking lots over at the high school uh, for sure is definitely one that we want to look into as well as any others that uh, can fit within the budget. Um, and uh, there'll be some additional reconfiguration of spaces as needed for basically for instructional purposes. And then currently uh, any, any projects that uh, or anything that may come up related to the bond 2016 uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, we fully meet the communities and the Board of Education's expectations with this project. As we get closer to the end of this work, there are, uh, th we do run th the risk of certain items, pick, um, certain things coming, coming our way that we did not plan for. Um, and we want to make sure that the funding is there in the event that we need that additional funding. Um, and as I uh, mentioned in the beginning, we do um, work closely with our architects and prioritize these projects uh, based on their recommendations and ultimately cost because uh, we do have a limited budget that we need to work within. Part of uh, the, the funding mechanism for this work is going to be a proposition to draw down $5 million from the current capital reserve. Now, it's important um, for the Board of Education and for the community to know that this is money that is reserved. It is not an additional uh, tax that is being imposed upon the community. This is money that is sitting there um, in, our, in our bank accounts and was reserved for these specific reasons. Uh, but we do need the, the board's uh, approval and the voters' approval in order to draw down those funds and spend them on the projects. So currently we are operating under uh, the old reserve, which was established um, back in 2015 for $20 million. And there was a balance from a previous reserve that had been transferred into that. Um, we are asking the community for two things. 
um, come May because that reserve has been um, fully funded. We can no longer allocate any additional funding to it. So the two propositions that we are, well, it's going to be one proposition with two purposes that we are proposing, um, which is the establishment of a new reserve uh, in the amount of $30 million and a drawdown of $5 million from the current capital reserve. Now, any balance that remains in the current capital reserve will then get transferred into the new reserve to start that reserve off. Um, let me go to the next slide so I can paint the picture for you a little bit easier. So back in 2015, there was a $20 million reserve that was established. That reserve accumulates interest over the years as the balance is increased. And this slide details all of the ins and outs of that reserve over, over the last few years. Ultimately, at the end of June of 2021, there was a balance of $8.5 million remaining in that reserve. So in this instance, we are asking the community and the board for a $5 million drawdown, which would leave an allocation of $3.5 million that would get transferred into the new $30 million reserve uh, to start out the 21, 20, 22, 23 school year. Some of the future capital planning um, that uh, we did briefly touch on smaller projects, but now getting into the bigger projects, um, the bu building condition survey for the district is due to the state by the year 2024. Um, that's a report that's due every five years, except the state made some law changes. So ours hasn't been submitted in quite some time, but we are still in compliance. And um, the district architects uh, will be working on that five-year plan um, for, for us over the next year and we will submit that in a timely manner. Detailed in that plan will be all of the bigger projects that uh, the district uh, should start to plan for. For example, we have been talking about replacing all of our roofs and I fully anticipate that the roof work that is needed throughout the district will be placed into that uh, five-year facilities plan. And that the, 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 the district administration will continue to work with the Board of Education to develop how we could possibly fund um, those uh, those projects I, and I, it kind of starts with this proposition where we establish a new reserve that could be one way of helping to fund certain portions of that project uh, we could explore possibly going out for another bond uh, we could also uh, tap into possibly some of the federal stimulus money um, if it is related to some type of HVAC work um, for, so whatever money is remaining there we could also use that allocation um, but we'll work closely with the Board of Education over the next few years as the five-year five facility plan, uh, the building condition survey comes out and, um, and, and we'll develop a plan accordingly. Moving along to the fund balance um, and reserves analysis. So um, we start by looking at uh, what our current financial condition is. Um, what factors are going to impact our financial conditions, such as staffing, property taxes, employee benefits, state aid, the current economy, um, and what does the future uh, look like for the district? And I, it's one of the things that we're very happy to um, report out to the board and to the community and um, our auditors, both internal and independent, uh, internal and external, always make sure that they highlight this. We are uh, in excellent financial condition as a district. Um, that is intentional. We intentionally uh, make sure that we properly plan all of our, all of our uses of our reserves um, and, and our expenditures over the years. And uh, Moody's did not update, um, did not give us an update this year, but um, if they did, it would probably have even improved from these positive comments because of all of the federal stimulus um, that is being pushed out to or had been pushed out to districts as well as the additional foundation aid. And as we move into the, the next couple of slides and we, go, we look at the balances, it's really going to paint a picture uh, for the board and for the community as to uh, how that happened, um, how it translated into our bank account. Um, and how really it's allowed us and afforded us the opportunity to to do all these wonderful things that we do here from an, an instructional and a programmatic uh, standpoint. So there's two different uh, 
two, two different ways to look at uh, fund balance and reserves. When do you use it and when do you not use it? So fund balance and reserves is not intended to be used to pay your day-to-day -day bills. And we always use the example, you don't want to have to use your savings to pay your mortgage. You may have to from time to time. Uh, but it can't be the monthly source of paying your mortgage. And that's the way reserves and fund balance should be handled and treated as a district. Yes, use it for one-time expenditures. We need a new roof on the house. Let's use our reserves. Um, there's an unexpected expense that came up. Well, let's tap into the reserves. That's what they're there for. This is a history of uh, the fund balance uh, for, the, for the district going back to 2018. And as you can see, we've maintained a very healthy uh, fund balance over those years. Um, there's two lines at, at towards the bottom that I want to draw everyone's attention to. And uh, the first line shows the change in fund balance and reserves. But the next slide, the, the, the line at the bottom talks about the change in fund balance and reserves excluding drawdowns. And if you specifically look at the second to last column for the June 30th, 2021 year ending, you'll see that there's a two and a half million dollar loss that we experienced in that school year. That is largely due to the $5 million drawdown that we had for the bathroom renovation project. But if you looked at it from a purely operational standpoint, we actually generated almost $3 million that year. And that was largely because of or entirely because of the federal funding that we were able to allocate uh, towards uh, COVID related expenses. So 2021 was the first year where the district had actually started operating again um, as normal as we could. And there were a lot of expenses related to COVID, mostly uh, in the areas of technology and instruction. And we were able to, at the end, by the end of the year, allocate all of those expenses to the federal uh, grants and offset any expenses that the district incurred, ultimately resulting in a positive surplus for us at the end of the year. Currently, we are projecting a, a surplus at the end of this year as well, and that is, in a, in, uh, that is due to the fact of, that the additional state aid that we received uh, in the form of foundation aid, uh, that was not originally um, part of the uh, the original governor's budget last year. So some of the trends that we look at when we're um, planning the budget, some of the big items, as I mentioned earlier, the CPI, state aid, uh, pension costs, and major medical. And sometimes it really helps to look at things on a graph. So we do have a few line charts to kind of go over things. Um, so this is uh, the CPI over the um, last uh, is that 20 years um, and the CPI this year uh, as of December 31st closed at 4.7 percent and as we discussed last week the tax cap calculation is limited to 2 percent so um, we were only allowed to use a factor of 2 percent while calculating the levy but you can really see how the swings go above that 2 percent line and go below that 2 percent line um, in certain years depending on what's going on in the economy. This slide shows the state aid, um, and it's been pretty linear over the years until finally we got the additional foundation aid that had been owed to us. Uh, just as a reminder, eight and a half million dollars is what was owed to the district in the form of foundation aid on an annual basis. We did receive our first uh, two and a half million this year. Um, we're getting another three and a half million next year, and then the balance will come in the year after that. And you can really see on this slide how it's going up in the end. We've been fortunate to have favorable, pen favorable pension rates over the last few years. Uh, e these are the uh, percentages for uh, ERS and TRS, the employee retirement system and the teacher's retirement system, um, largely attributable probably to the, the, the healthy stock market that we've had over the years, although there is a large factor in here that has to do with participation or uh, I should say pension contributions that are made by active employees. So um, we should s we'll see a uh, little, little later on in the year where these are going to start to trend. Um, historically, they have trended 
um, with market fluctuations. So if you look back to uh, back on the slides to 2009, 2010, you had the financial crisis, and then right after that, it tended to go up a little bit, um, probably because it's lagging a little bit on the on the returns. So we'll see if the market continues to go down um, for the remainder of the year, how that will end up uh, reflecting in the TRS and ERS rates for next year. But as of right now, the, the key is that it's very steady. Um, lastly, the um, major medical. Um, this shows the, um, the change uh, that in premiums that the district receives on an annual basis. So every year we get a uh, notification from NYSHIP to show us what their rates are going to be for next year, and that's what we have to increase, uh, typically increase uh, people's premiums by, employees' premiums by. Um, so this is not showing it that, that actual, where it slopes down is not actually a decrease in expenses, it's actually just a decrease in the rate. So it's going from a, a higher rate to a lower rate, but still increasing. So major medical um, tends to tends to usually go up um, in most years. Uh, this this year was in 2000 in January of 22 was the uh, largest increase that we had seen in a while, um, and uh, a lot of the reasons have to do with uh, coming uh, coming out the backside of the pandemic. Just to give a, a quick snapshot of um, the current budget year, how we are projecting, we talked about that a little bit earlier, we are projecting a, a 1.2 uh, 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 surplus at the end of the year to add to our fund balance. And uh, we do try to project out next year. And we are projecting a, a break even year. We're happy to report that we will be projecting to break even with this budget or approximately there. Um, there are usually uh, some revenue items that come in a little more than expected. There's usually, uh, you know, additional state aid that might come in at some point throughout the year that we didn't know about, refunds of prior years, uh, insurance payments. So um, to have a, a budget developed where we feel this confident uh, for the next year um, it is really, it's really um, a good sign um, for us from a financial standpoint to know that we are are in this place and that we can do everything that we're planning to do with for these students and for this community um, within the budget so just to sum everything up we have a revised budget of um, 182 million 892 thousand three hundred and fifty uh, with a proposed tax levy increase of 1.59 percent I just want to make sure I say that one more time that what is reported in Newsday is 2.06, but we have decreased that levy to a 1.59% increase. Um, and then the budget calendar and summary. So this is uh, the last budget workshop. Uh, on April 6th, the Board of Education will have the opportunity to adopt the budget for voter approval. On Tuesday, April 26th, we will have the BOCES admin budget. As a BOCES component, we are required to approve the BOCES budget on an annual basis. And then lastly, on uh, May 10th, we will have the public hearing. And the school budget vote for the 22-23 school year will be on Tuesday, May 17th, in the Howitt West Gymnasium from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m and I would be happy to answer any questions that the board may have now. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me just pull up my notes here, I'm sorry. Uh, first, I'm happy to see the tax levy drop. Would we, were, we were at 2.06. 2.06. And now we're, we're down to that, which is almost a half percent. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, Ms. Maloney, um, on slide nine, we spoke about, or you spoke about providing training to staff. Yes. Um, obviously, social, emotional, those needs are not 
limited to our special education students. I'm just curious specifically, the training, is it gonna go to all teachers? Are we limiting to special education teachers? Are we doing aides and monitors? We're doing everything. Everything, so aides and monitors as well. Sure, we already started on that conversation. That's part of um, the work that we're going to do with the new assistant to the superintendent for HR. Okay. I've been working um, in particular with the head of the union of aides and monitors and we have a plan, but it's really for everything. We're actually starting some of the work on our next superintendent's conference day. Okay. Um, and we're starting with uh, the PPS staff and the deans and the APs, and then we're gonna grow it next year. Happy to hear that. I'm happy to hear that, thank you. Um, so I, I have some questions too, and I just wanna Go right behind Suzanne, because I was looking at number nine, too. So in addition to what Suzanne had asked, which was um, a great question, um, the training to staff, is that going to be um, our own staff training our staff, or is it going to be professional development brought in? Is it going to be a mixture? Um, and are the students going to have um, taught any any kind of training at all, too, that they might be able to see something that um, other people don't recognize? Sure, so I'll start with um, what we're doing this April. I think that's the best place to start. And it's based on actually work that they're doing in the elementary schools, um, and the focus is on helping the adults really understand the student behavior um, and really not from a deficit model, right? So what are the skills that that student is lacking? And then really diving into really looking at, let's say for example, a student has difficulty behaving in class, let's say. Um, really looking at, well, what was happening right beforehand? So there's, so the point of this is that there has been professional development with an outsider um, and then, but we are having our turnkey um, coach, actually, Leslie Ruth, is going to be working because she really is an expert in this. And then we are going to also be pulling in, and I know that Dr. Olson was trying to pull in Mark Brackett to do follow-up work as far as ruler. We have all of our elementary people actually going for the same training that the middle school and the high school people did. So we first reach out to the experts, we develop expertise among our own, and then they're gonna turnkey it. Now, I didn't answer your question about students yet, though. And for students, what we need to do is, first off, have all the adults on board. We need all the adults to be using the same language, have the same expectations, and then help kids develop the skills. So that's gonna be a heavy lift. That's gonna be part of the work that I'm doing next year and I will be spending all summer doing research about that so that we have a comprehensive, multifaceted approach. Thank you. Hey, Jen. Um, I just had a question. I love the new courses being proposed. The Envest, the uh, the uh, environmental science and the AP, uh, I'm sorry, the region search science with the environmental AP class. Did I understand that right? Four science periods a day for a student. Double, uh, two periods, two two periods of science a, a day. It's it's for the course will be taught in unison together. So they will the curriculum will be double fold. So a child will be taking essentially AP environmental science at the same time as their region's earth science. So how many periods of science a day would that two, be? Two Just periods, two. Two periods every day. Wow. Okay. And then plus labs as well? That includes the that will include the lab period. That's what mm -hmm. it that's the two periods. Okay. Great. So, Jen as well, 
Um, in addition, in relationship to the courses um, that we're going to be offering, how would it be possible, or please you know, tell me, to, at the middle school level, because it's so limited as to how many courses they can actually have in addition to the work they're doing now, isn't it? So how are we gonna incorporate that into the, the Howitt middle school schedule? So the um, first three, cl the three classes that I mentioned, the three courses, those are high school courses, but the Heritage Spanish would be in lieu of a typical Spanish class, right? So it's, it's not adding something to a, ch a child's schedule. It would be their world language, but it would be um, uh, the style of, of a literacy type of background where you are already fluent in the oral language, but now let's build up all the other capac capacities of the language. So the, the first three then are basically for the high school level? Yes, okay. Yeah, they're high school level. All right, course. that clears it up, thank you. Uh, if you don't mind, I also have um, 17, uh, that would be Mike, page 17. When we talk about the carports and the kilowatts and such, um, I noticed that you said that Howard has less kilowatts than any other school. I'm not a pro by any means in knowing that, that type of kilowatts, but Howard seems to be a big school as compared in surface to some of the other ones. So why is the Howitt the less kilowatts? Is it that we can't fit it, the carports anywhere else? And would it be, I'm sure it's sufficient then with the numbers you gave us. Yeah, so the, so two parts to that, Kathy. Um, yeah, there was nowhere else on the facility the way it's currently laid out that we were willing to put the carports. We didn't want to put them along Van Cott or along Grant because they would be right in everyone's front window. So we stuck with the back lot. Um, right now that lot is a pile of dirt and we're actually going ahead and laying the conduit for these, um, for these structures right now um, so that they are in place and we don't have to dig up the, uh, the concrete after it's cured. Um, but um, we did stay to the back on purpose, and yes, it is going to generate significantly less than most of the other buildings, um, but the savings is, is, is as a whole throughout the district. So, yes, in the end, you know, the how it may end, I'm not just making this up, but how it may end up still having a higher electric bill than, a, than the high school, for example, which is a much larger facility, but we're getting a lot more uh, kilowatts out of the structures that are at that high school. Um, the the plan is to, to, to look at other places where we could put solar arrays, um, but as far as the carports go, in our discussions um, with the building administration and with the Board of Education, we just felt that it was best to stay in that back lot and not go any further with the project. Okay, so just a simple question that might be really simple. Um, a carport, when it snows and you have a significant amount of snow, do you still get the wattage that you get? Or, or what happens with that? I'm sorry, do you still get the? I'm, I'm imagining you don't get the same turnaround because it's covered with snow. So what would we have to clean them off or, or just let it melt, hopefully? <laughs> it, it would melt. Just wondering. OK. Yes, it would melt. And <laughs> That's Mr. Defendini's job, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Actually, can I just ask one more question? I just thought of it. I'm assuming, although I don't like to assume, that we're not looking at the roof of the new aquatic center because it's not flat, correct? Or? We're not looking at the roof of the new aquatic center, no. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for a, a very thorough presentation tonight. Thank you, Mr. Goldberg. Okay. 
We have uh, several resolutions to approve that are related to the May 17th budget vote and election. Mrs. D'Amico, may we have a motion to approve the resolution authorizing the establishment of a reserve fund? Okay, so resolution authorizing the establishment of a reserve fund for Farmingdale Union Free School District, Nassau and Suffolk Counties, New York, pursuant to section 3651 of the education law. Be it resolved by the Board of Education of Farmingdale Union Free School District, Nassau and Suffolk Counties, New York, as follows. Section one, pursuant to section 3651 of the education law, there is hereby established a reserve fund in and for Farmingdale Union Free School District, Nassau and Suffolk Counties, New York, which shall be designated as the 2022 Buildings and Facilities Capital Reserve Fund of said school district. Section two, such reserve fund is hereby established for financing in whole or in part the following objects or purposes of said school district. The construction of improvements to reconstruction of and equipping, equipping and additions to various school district buildings and facilities, including original furnishings, equipment, machinery, apparatus, appurtenances, <laughs> excuse me, and site and incidental improvements and expenses in connection therewith. Section three, the ultimate amount of such reserve funds shall be $30 million plus accrued interest and investment earnings thereon. Section four, the probable term of such reserve fund shall be in 10 years. Section five, the initial source from which funds for such reserve fund will be obtained is a transfer of the remaining balance as of June 30th, 2022 from the existing, existing capital fund designated 2015 Building and Facilities Capital Reserve Fund, remaining after appropriation of $5 million, therefrom, if so approved by the voters at the annual school district meeting and election. The source from which funds for each reserve fund thereafter will be obtained is as follows. Surplus dollars as unappropriated fund balance available to the district when it closes its book books every June 30th. Surplus intended to mean the difference between revenues and expenses in the general fund and other legally available funds to the district. Section six, this resolution shall take effect upon the approval thereof by a majority of the qualified voters of said school district voting on a proposition, therefore submitted at the annual school district meeting and election to be held May 17th, 2022. The details of such proposition to be specified by a further resolution of this Board of Education. Section seven, the form of the proposition and notice thereof to be so submitted shall substantially be as provided in said, for, in said further resolution. Section eight, the resolution shall take effect upon the approval of the aforesaid proposition and upon approval of such proposition, no further action of this Board of Education will be required to perfect the establishment of such reserve fund. May I have a second? Second. second. Thank you, Mario. So this is a roll call vote. So as I call out your name, please give me an I or an A. Mario Espinosa. Aye. Anthony Giordano. Aye. Kathy Lively. Aye. Ralph Morales. Aye. Suzanne D'Amico. Aye. And I am an I. Motion carries. Mrs. D'Amico, may we have a motion that authorizes the inclusion of the Capital Reserve Fund resolution at the annual school district meeting and election. Resolution authorizing inclusion of a capital reserve fund proposition at the annual school district meeting and election. Be it resolved by the Board of Education of Farmingdale Union Free School District, Nassau and Suffolk Counties, New York as follows. 
Section 1, the proposition here and after set forth, is hereby authorized to be submitted for the approval of the qualified voters at the annual school district meeting and election to be held in said school district on the 17th of May, 2022. Section 2, the school district clerk is hereby authorized and directed to include as a part of the notice of the annual district meeting and election notice with reference to the submission of said proposition in substantially the following form. Notice is hereby further given that at said annual school district meeting and election to be held on May 17th, 2022, the following proposition will be submitted. Capital Reserve Fund Proposition. Shall the following resolution be adopted to it, resolved that the Farmingdale Union Free School District is hereby authorized one, to expend $5 million from the 2015 Buildings and Facilities Capital Reserve Fund to pay the cost of the construction of improvements to and reconstruction of and equipping and additions to various school district buildings and facilities, including original furnishings, equipment, machinery, apparatus, appurtenances, Pertinence, sorry about that, and the site and incidental improvements and expenses in connection therewith, and two, to establish an incidental improvements and expenses in connection therewith, I, I'm sorry, I repeated myself, excuse me, and two, to establish a new capital reserve fund pursuant to section 3651 of the education law to be designated 2022 Buildings and Facilities Capital Reserve Fund for the construction of Improvements to, reconstruction of, and equipping, and additions to various school district buildings and facilities, including original furnishings, equipment, machinery, apparatus, appurtenance, I'll never get that word right, uh, I apologize, um, and site and incidental improvements and expenses in connection therewith at an ultimate amount of $30 million plus accrued interest and investment earnings with a probable term of 10 years, the source of funding to be surplus dollars and or legally available funds available to the district when it closes its books every June 30th, together with the transfer of the remaining balance of the existing 2015 Buildings and Facilities Capital Reserve Fund. Secret status of project said $5 million capital improvement project has been determined by the Board of Education to be a type two action pursuant to 6 NYCRR part 617.5 C1, 2 and 10 of the regulations of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation promulgated pursuant to the State Environmental Quality Review Act, CEQRA, as to which it has been determined as such, such project will not result in any significant adverse impact upon the environment. Section three, said $5 million capital improvement project is hereby determined by the Board of Education to be a type two action pursuant to six NYCRR part 617 Point five C one, two and ten of the regulations of the New York State Department of, of Environmental Conservation promulgated pursuant to the State Environmental Quality Review Act CEQRA, as to which it is hereby determined as such such product project will not result in any significant adverse impact upon the environment. Section four, this resolution shall take effect immediately. Thank you. This is a roll call vote also. Mario Espinosa. Aye. Anthony Giordano. Aye. Kathy Lively. Aye. Ralph Morales. Aye. Suzanne D'Amico. Aye. And I am an aye. Motion carries. Mrs. D'Amico, may we have a motion to approve the newspapers for legal notices? It's a much shorter one. Yes, it is. <laughs> a lot of reading tonight. <laughs> Approval of updated newspapers for legal notices, in parentheses, name change, 
Resolved that the Farmingdale Union Free School District Board of Education approve the designation of the Nassau Observer and the Massapequa Post as official newspapers for legal advertising and notices for the Farmingdale School District and other publications for supplemental advertising during the 2021-2022 school year. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Mrs. D'Amico, may we have a motion to adopt the annual budget vote and election resolution? Adoption of the annual budget vote and election resolution. Resolved that the Farmingdale Union Free School District Board of Education adopt the following resolution. Resolved that the annual budget vote and election of the Farmingdale Union Free School District of the towns of Oyster Bay, Nassau County, and Babylon, Suffolk County, New York, shall be held on Tuesday, May 17th, 2022, between the hours of 6 a.m. and 9 p.m in the West Gymnasium of the Weldon E. Howitt Middle School, 70 Van Cott Avenue, Farmingdale, New York, and the public hearing shall be held on Tuesday, May 10th, 2022, at 8 p.m. in the auditorium of the Weldon E. Howitt Middle School in said district for the purposes set forth in the annex notice. Resolved that said notice be published once in each of four weeks in the seven weeks preceding the annual budget and election voting in the Massapequa Post and the Nassau Observer, two newspapers having general circulation in the district. The first notice must, appe must appear at least 45 days before the date of the vote. Resolved that the school district clerk is hereby authorized to amend and or supplement this notice here and after set forth from time to time as in her discretion, such amendment may be required. Resolved that Kathy Lively is designated as permanent chairperson of the election and Mary Rogers will serve as the alternate chairperson in accordance with section 2025 of the education law. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Mrs. D'Amico, may I have a motion to approve the Board of Ed Elections Memorandum of Agreement? I make a motion to approve the memorandum of agreement with the Nassau County Board of Elections regarding election services for the May 17th, 2022 budget vote and election and to authorize the board president to sign said agreement. Do I have a second? Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Mrs. D'Amico, may I have a motion to appoint the Chief Inspector, Assistant Clerks, and Inspectors for the Budget Vote and Election? I make a motion to approve a resolution to appoint the Chief Election Inspector, Assistant Clerks, and Inspectors of the Election for the School District Budget Vote and Election, dated May 17, 2022. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to open the meeting for the second public participation. Once again, please be sure to clearly state your name when you approach the microphone. Okay, okay. thank you everyone for your comments. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you everyone.